Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. Uh, tonight I just wanted to share something with you that I thought was pretty interesting that I found. Uh, we've talked before about uh, premillennialism and the pre-trib rapture, and we've seen that the ch early church fathers taught those. Somewhere in the neighborhood of the 250s and on up, it switches to amillennialism. And so all of that is no longer believed. And so it's interesting when you find a really old text that kind of explains things. So I wanted to share a couple of things with you. We, we looked at this one a little bit going another direction a few weeks ago, but this is pretty interesting. And I just want to share this with you. So here is uh, Eusebius book three, and st we're still working on doing a nice English translation of it. Anyway, in Book three, he goes through and talks about the apostles and where they witnessed, where they're buried, who took uh, what church and what king did what. A whole lot of interesting information, early church history. So he writes about the time between three, uh, the time of Jesus up to 325, which is where he's at. So in this particular one, he's talking about several different things. The first bishop of Rome is Linus, of course, not Peter, but, you know. Anyway, that's why it's really interesting to see early church fathers that just tell you everything. But um, when we get to the end of this book, let me get down here to the end of it. He, ha he talks about the writings of a guy named Papias. So Papias, well, let me, let me back up. John is on the Isle of P uh, Patmos, and then he gets um, uh, released from imprisonment. He goes back to Ephesus where he always used it as a headquarters to plant churches. Timothy is the pastor there. So John's not pastoring, he's just overseeing. And he's going out and planting churches. And so he continues to do that after he gets back. But he has two main disciples, or I, actually I should say three. Uh, Polycarp is a main disciple with him and he becomes bishop of, of uh, a church later on. The two other guys are Ariston and... Um, John the Presbyter. So there's another John there at Ephesus. Well, Papias is a guy who uh, he didn't study directly under any of the apostles, but he studied under the disciples of the apostle. He's, so he's second generation. So he's writing a bunch of stuff. So um, I don't know that Aristrian or John the Presbyter actually wrote anything. Polycarp did, and we have his epistle, which is amazing. Um, but let's just look at this. So this is a guy named Papias, and it says, and this is Eusebius several hundred years later writing about it. He said, five books of Papias still exist entitled the Expositions of the Oracles of the Lord. So he wrote a five volume set. Now, Hegesippus is another guy that wrote a five volume set. Hegesippus is amazing, and we only know his stuff from quotes, much like Papias, just quotes of other people. Hegesippus was a guy that wrote a five-volume set on the Gospels and what happened slightly afterwards. And it was said that any possible question you could ask about the Gospels, he had it covered from eyewitness accounts. Papias is going to do the same thing. So he writes a five-volume text. And Irenaeus says... He's an ancient writer, student of John, uh, uh, meaning he's a student of John the Presbyter, who was a student of John the Apostle. And he was an associate with Polycarp, so he knew Polycarp. Uh, he records these things in the, his fourth book of the five-volume set. So that's how we know it wrote a five-volume set. Uh, he says, this is Irenaeus's account, but Papi himself in the preference to his discorders, does not say he was a student or an eyewitness of the apostles, but received his doctrine from their disciples. So this is what Papias says, and I thought this was really cool. In addition to what I witnessed, he says, <clears throat> I will also write down everything that I have learned from the elders, that'd be the disciples of the apostles, and treasured in my memory to confirm the truth. Now, unlike many people, I don't want to hear from those who, uh, I want to hear from those who tell the truth, not fanciful stories. I do not want to hear about foreign philosophy, only those who teach what the Lord taught, the truth itself. 
if I met with anyone who had been a disciple of the apostles anywhere, I made it a point to inquire about what they learned from the apostles. What was taught by Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, James, John, Matthew, or any of the other apostles of the Lord, disciples of the Lord? Uh, what was taught by the elders, you know, their disciples, Aristian, John the Presbyter, or other disciples of the apostles? I learned more from listening to those eyewitnesses than from all the books about those times. And I would imagine so. If you could sit down and talk with John or Peter or something and get firsthand information, that's the way to go. So he goes on and talks about these things. But let me go down here. He talks about certain miracles that he recorded, things like that. So uh, here is <coughs> something that he says. Now, again, this is Eusebius writing in the 4th century, 325. Eusebius is an amillennialist, so he doesn't believe in a premillennial reign of Christ. He doesn't believe in a tribulation period, at least not officially. But in his book, he'll record all those that do. So I, that's why I thought it was interesting. But he says, Papias was the first to write these things down. So all the eyewitness accounts. So extra information would be cool. I would love, love, love to have the whole writings of Hegesippus Papias and anybody else like that. Um, so he was the first to write these down and other accounts from oral tradition. He also records, now this is really specific here. This is what we want to focus on right here. He says he also records specific unwritten parables of our Lord with his interpretation and other incredible things. So what he's saying here is that in the four Gospels, Jesus gave a series of parables. We all know those. And we know the one parable where he completely explains it. He doesn't completely explain every other parable. Well, apparently he did somewhere, according to this. So there's supposed to be these unwritten parables passed down by the disciples or something. Uh, and it's either new parables with interpretations or maybe it's just the parables in the New Testament, but most importantly, his interpretation. So, you know, the kingdom of heaven parables and all that stuff. If Jesus would say, okay, look, this is what it means. Point by point, every one of them. That would be interesting. That definitely might have something about a pre-trib rapture in it. Can you imagine Jesus saying, you didn't understand Matthew 24? Okay, let me spell it out for you. That would be really cool. So here's what's going on. So he does that. Now, note, we'll come right back to this, but look at what he says. Among these, in other words, among these supposed parables of our Lord with his interpretation, among the teachings about the, these parables is that there would be a literal 1,000-year reign where Christ would physically reign on earth after the resurrection of the dead. That's premillennialism. So that's, you know, what most of us believe. That's what they all believed up until mid-second century anyway. So this is one of those teachings. Now, he's not saying it's right or wrong at this point. He's saying Papias is a brilliant guy. He's got all these eyewitness accounts. He wrote down all this history. And he's got this one text that supposedly records these specific unwritten parables. And one of them, at least, teaches that there's a premillennial now, that's not a pre-trib, it's just pre-millennialism, okay? Uh, so, reign of Christ, and that would be physical, very literal. Now, he says here, I assume he got his ideas from taking the apostolic account too literally. So, first, this is an apostolic account. So, according to him, he wrote down information from the disciples of the apostles, that said, the apostles taught us, here's what Jesus told them, you know, off the record, as to the exact meanings of the parables. And one of those specific meanings is premillennialism. Okay. And so he's saying that can't be because we all know all millennialism is true. So that, that can't be right. He says, I suppose he got his ideas from taking those apostolic accounts 
too literally. He did not understand that they are symbols and that they represent the mystical and not the physical. It's evident from his discourses, discourses rather, that he was, this, this just blows me away, that he was of very limited intelligence. So you're saying this guy's brilliant, he's got all this cool stuff, and then he's very limited intelligence, he misunderstands everything. And then you go back a minute later talking about how brilliant he was. So something's kind of a miss there. It's really interesting. So anyway, now he goes on and says, his ideas are the reasons why other ecclesiastical writers, ecclesiastical means church history writers, held the same opinions. His writings were so close to the time of the apostles. That's why. So many church fathers like Irenaeus adopted his ideas. So he's saying, I believe on millennialism. Therefore, since everybody before me believed premillennialism, they all had to get off somehow with something. And it all stems from this guy, Papias, who's a brilliant guy that wrote all this cool history from misunderstanding a certain text. Well, I would submit to you that he understood exactly what he was being told. I mean, if I was to do an autobiography, not an autobiography, a biography on you and say, do you like cats or dogs? Are you allergic to bananas? What do you like? What was your history? Where did you go to school? And you just tell me one, two, three, four, five. I'm just going to assume you're telling the truth and I'm going to write it down. If you say you went to Harvard, I'm going to assume it's the Harvard we're thinking of, unless it's another Harvard. I would assume you would tell me that if there is such a thing. So just write down what you're being told. Now, if I can pick those things up and just read them and I can get confused that there's a premillennial type deal, then there's something amiss there. Now, if I could find those and read those and say, oh, OK, I get it. Yeah, he definitely misunderstood the text here. Then he would be right. So we need to find those documents and look at them. Um, but I just think it's amazing. So he goes on and says, yeah, that he recorded other accounts of our Lord, other things about Jesus outside the, the Gospels that were given to him by Aristian and John the Presbyter mentioned above. For those curious, we'll add a few details. And he talks about uh, things that happened with Mark, uh, Mattathias after he was picked to replace Judas, of certain miracles that happened and a few things. So pretty interesting. So let's go back up here. So this part here is what I want to look at. So, well, actually, let's come back to this in a second. So he says, this is probably where Irenaeus got his funny ideas. Number one of which is that there's a pre-millennial reign of Christ. Now, let's stop for a minute and look at what Irenaeus said. And we've done this before, but I'm kind of pulling it all together. So here is our book. This is unpublished yet. This is, and of course, you can grab your CBS off of the internet just about anywhere. But this is our book called The End Times by the Ancient Church Fathers. It's just the main church fathers that taught on, on prophecy. So if you take all the church fathers together, maybe 20% of them will say anything at all about prophecy. Okay, and so those that talk about prophecy, they're all premillennial. But they'll be talking about the Antichrist maybe or the second coming or something like that, and then drift into that's why you should be holy. So, and then here's a, a good avoid sin sermon, that kind of a thing. And some of them will mention the rapture. Most of them don't. And those that mention the rapture usually just say there's a rapture. They don't say pre, mid, post or anything. Just we're looking for the blessed hope, you know, that kind of thing. But out of those that do mention the rapture, there's a handful of quotes that lets you know where they think it are it is. And so far in the first, second century, they're all pre-millennial, which is really interesting because we've got this idea that somehow Darby in the 1700s invented the pre-trib rapture. You know, you could say the pre-trib rapture is wrong. Uh, I believe it. Calvary Chapel believes it. I'm a Calvary Chapel guy. Um, oh, by the way, I, I go to Calvary Chapel, Johnson County in Olathe, Kansas. So just wanted to throw that out there if you're ever in the area, come visit. But um, so that's what's interesting about it. Uh, so these end time church fathers, then uh, we'll, we'll see what they and he specifically mentioned Irenaeus. 
So what we're going to do here is look at, uh, in this book, we have an introduction, Irenaeus's end time teaching. What did he teach about the end times? And then there's Ephraim, Hippolytus, and a few other things. So in here, we'll just go to the first part of it here. Start at the beginning. He teaches premillennialism. Let's just read that real quick. We're just going to look at a couple things so we get an idea. There is a resurrection of the just that takes place after the destruction of the Antichrist. So there's there, there, there may or may not be, he hasn't said yet, but there may or may not be a pre-trib rapture resurrection. But there is a Antichrist in a seven-year period, and at the end of which there's going to be a resurrection of tribulation saints. We get that from Revelation 20 also. So that's that's pretty straightforward. And all the nations under his rule, when, once everything's taken care of. Many believers will make it through the tribulation and replenish the earth. That's how we get people in the in the millennial reign. The people that don't get raptured and somehow make it through the tribulation and in physical form and they reproduce and fill the earth. In the resurrection, we'll have fellowship and communion with the holy angels and union with spiritual beings. That's interesting. So there's a difference between spiritual beings and holy angels. Interesting have no clue because I'm not there yet, but whatever is up there that loves the Lord will love us and we'll love them. Anyway, so the new heavens and the earth are created and this kind of stuff. Look at this here. I thought this is, this is one of my favorite quotes from Irenaeus. All these things are literal. They're not symbolic like Eusebius just said. They're literal. And Christians who allegorize them are immature Christians. So if I was to stand up at a pulpit and say, well, when it says um, don't get drunk, what it means is don't drink, get in a car and kill somebody. If you're going to get drunk, don't drive. That's all it means. But that's not what it said. Well, yeah, but it's symbolic of something else. You know, don't fornicate. Well, that, that means um, uh, that means going to one of those countries where you can actually marry four or five wives. Yeah, that's what that means. That, that's fornication. Fooling around is not fornication. It's like, that's not what the word means. It's very specific. Be specific. And so, in the same token, uh, don't get drunk means don't get drunk. So, don't get drunk. It's real simple, very literal. Uh, and so, there's a resurrection. There's a tribulation period. There's an antichrist. There's a second coming. There's a new Jerusalem. All those things are literal. The, Jews, Jew, the New Jerusalem is not a symbol for the church age. It's an actual city like Washington, D.C., Moscow, New Jerusalem, Old Jerusalem. It's a city. It's very literal. So if you allegorize these things, you're an immature Christian. doesn't mean you're not saved. It means you're confused. Point being, if you are an amillennialist, you don't need to be in a pulpit. And that's kind of what he's saying. And that's his opinion. Not necessarily yours or mine, but I'm showing you where we're going with this. So he's definitely pre-millennial. Now, here's a quote about, because you could look at this and think, well, maybe he's post-trip or mid-trip or something like that. So here's a quote about this. Here's just one quote. He says, uh, uh, <clears throat> when at the end, the church will suddenly be caught up from this. Now, what would he be talking about at that point? When the church as a whole is harpazoed up, that's a rapture, right? Okay, so in the end, when the church is suddenly raptured, then it will be said, there will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning, nor will be. So it's pretty obvious there is a rapture. Then there's a tribulation period, which is worse than it ever has been. Now, some people can look at this and say, well, that's either a pre-trib or a mid-trib, but it's we all agree it's definitely not post-trib. Whether he's right or wrong, he's definitely not a post-trib guy, okay? Uh, he's either pre or mid, and some people might say, well, he's mid. And that all hinges on what you think a tribulation is. Is it a three-and-a-half-year period or a seven-year period? If you go through and you look at all the teachings, they make it very clear when they say tribulation, and again, whether it's right or wrong, as far as what we think, how they use the words is the only thing we care about. 
they use the word tribulation to mean a seven year period. And we could take uh, some time and go through all the quotes and see that. But if tribulation means seven year period and the rapture of the church happens and then there's going to be that seven year period, that's pre-trip. So this is just one quote. There's a whole bunch more. We'll see that Hippolytus, uh, Ephraim, and there's, I don't know, a handful of guys uh, that are pre-trib, pre-millennial. So everybody agrees they're pre-millennial because they're very specific. And a lot of people don't want to look at the pre-trib rapture angle. Uh, but people that are all millennial will just say the same thing that Eusebius did, just that you know, they got confused somehow by taking it too literally. Well, I'd like to find those things out. So here's the thing tonight. Here's the new piece of information. So that's the Irenaeus for what it's worth. So obviously he got that idea he sang from Pap Papias uh, or Papias, however you want to say it. And the idea is, to do, do, where did I go? Yeah, this one here. So he... And this is the main idea right here. He records specific unwritten parables of our Lord with his interpretation and other incredible things. One is that there will be a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ physically on earth after the resurrection. So pre-millennial. And he says that's crazy. Oh, well, that's fine. But uh, notice he's not saying that these specific unwritten parables are Gnostic. They're fake. They're made up. All the way through here, he's saying he's meticulous. He's only getting the things that Aristian, John, and, and, and Polycarp and these other guys told him. And if they told him, this is what I learned, that's what he wrote down. And he's not saying that he's um, a con artist or anything. He's saying he just misunderstood that because there's no way that could be true. So what we need to do is look and see if any of those things are around. Now, there is a rumor or legend, I guess I should say, that there is a text in the Ethiopian canon that is supposedly the things that Jesus taught the apostles after his resurrection and before his ascension during that 40-day period. Now, those have not been translated into English yet, as far as I know. I'm looking forward to it. But I started researching around, and apparently the same kind of thing exists in several languages, uh, Syriac, Armenia, things like that. <clears throat> so I found this the other day, and I thought this was pretty interesting. This is called the Testament of Our Lord Jesus, okay? And it's a, the, the best copy is like maybe 10th century, somewhere around there, Middle Ages, basically. But there are pieces of it that go all the way back to the 5th, to the 4th. And the oldest one we have is somewhere around 200. Um, so you don't know how much has been added or whatever. But I want to read this to you. And this is pretty interesting. So supposedly this says, this is the testament or the words which our Lord, um, of our Lord, when he rose from the dead and spoke to the holy apostles, which were written in eight books by Clement of Rome, the disciple of Peter. Now, Clement of Rome, we haven't talked about him much, but he was a disciple of Peter, interesting guy. He wrote first Clement for sure. So it's another church father thing that we might want to look at. Um, but so this says, this reports to be a writing of Clement. Eight, there's supposedly these eight books, which has all this stuff in it. Now, this is interesting because the first 19 chapters are all about teachings that our Lord gave the apostles between the time of the resurrection and the ascension. So just like what's supposed to be in the Ethiopian canon. And then all of a sudden it changes and it's all about baptism rites and circumcision, not circumcision, baptism, communion, uh, orders of uh, virgins and, and widows and, and how to pay your, your presbyters on, you know, what days you take off for you know, that kind of stuff. So it's how they organize their church, uh, which would be interesting if you want to know how they did it. it. has nothing to do with us because it's none of it's binding on us. It's just how they ran their church. So it's pretty obvious the first thing is either fake or real, but really interesting to read. The other 80% of the text is just something somebody tacked on. We see the same thing with um, the Didache. 
that thing is rock solid very i would encourage everybody to to study it along with your bible uh it's what the churches did and how they practiced and it's obviously written between 50 and 100 a.d so somewhere in that time period peter and paul could have still been alive when this was written john definitely was so you know this is really interesting but later on you'll find the teaching of the apostles where it's that exact document plus a bunch of stuff at it later on you'll find the constitutions of the church constitutions and it's the same thing with all that plus a bunch of other stuff at it so that's kind of what it looks like but in chapter eight and nine i just want to share these with you because this is pretty interesting so they've asked the lord to give them more information about the end times and he's like well i already told you basically yet but i'm gonna okay i'll tell you more so this is supposedly the same kind of stuff that is in the ethiopian canon uh, um the uh, the syriac language so that would be over there and there's several different versions of this they're all about the same but multiple i think there's eight or so different manuscripts from different time periods so let's just read this this is interesting so according to this according to what clement said if this is real uh and whether it is or not this would be the kind of thing that papias is talking about and eusebius didn't say that this is junk he said this is probably good he just misunderstood it so let's read it and see if we misunderstand it so it says there will arise much turmoil in the churches of all the nations so not just in one country but all over the world the churches will be in turmoil evil shepherds will arise that will prove to be unjust slothful greedy lovers of pleasure lovers of gain lovers of money talkative I, maybe that means gossiping boastful haughty gluttonous gluttonous that's interesting so many churches today will will kick you out if you're a drunk but not try to work with you if you're overweight and that's really dangerous to our health perverse wrath no, they, no one should be really kicked out but they should be we should have programs to help people for things like that rash given to delights vainglorious opposing the ways of the gospel uh fleeing from the straight fleeing rather from the straight gate removing from themselves every persecution by not speaking of my humiliation isn't that interesting so muslims won't bother you if you say i'm a christian but i'm just you know standing here when you start talking about jesus died on the cross to save you and you have to believe that in order to be saved that's when persecution comes so we'll just you know let them believe whatever that's an evil shepherd so uh, that's pretty interesting uh rejecting my words rejecting all the words of truth slandering all the ways of piety and not repenting for their sins uh, i i can think of a lot of churches like that or a few anyway therefore they shall be the cause of unbelief among the nations hatred of the brotherhood the wickedness the bitterness the slothfulness the envy the hate for hatred the strife theft the oppression the drunkenness the debauchery the lasciviousness the licentiousness the fornication and all such works that are contrary to the commands of life these are things that kill you so you'd want to stay away from them uh it says many will put away repentance gentleness peace meekness modesty and piety and compassion because the shepherds heard these things and did not do them so if your pastor says it's okay it must be okay and that that's kind of what's going on here moreover they did not practice my commandments making themselves examples of wickedness in that nation but the time shall come when some of them will deny me will stir up confessions confusions rather in the earth and put a trust in a mortal king so i'm not sure what they mean by that but if you know jesus is god incarnate are they saying jesus is just a guy or are they saying well jesus is gone so we need a man to rule us kind of like a pope or a bishop or something eastern orthodoxy roman catholicism uh, you know whatever it could be something like that 
could be a new age type deal. Somebody saying, I am the Christ, something like that. Uh, but they put their trust in a mortal king. Uh, but they who in my name endure to the end shall be saved. Uh, then they, these, these weird pastors or shepherds, shall ordain man-made commandments unlike the commandments in which my father is well pleased. Well, and unlike the book and the commandments of which my father is well pleased. So it sounds like we're supposed to be taking the Bible literally, the book, you know, and the commandments. They're probably literal. So, you know, don't fornicate, don't kill people. Probably means exactly that. So Jesus coming back probably means Jesus coming back. In the future, probably means in the future. So take it literally, in other words. It says, they will reject both my elect and my upright ones who are pure, modest, merciful, quiet, kind, always acknowledging he who dwells in them. And I made a, a note here, um, uh, always looking for the one who dwells in them. That sounds strange at first, because if he's always dwelling in you, why are you looking for him? He's right here. But in other words, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, but we're looking for something, specifically the, the coming of our Lord. So in other words, the rapture. So that's pretty interesting. And, and he explains that here. So these people, the upright ones are pure, modest, merciful, quiet, kind, taking everything literally, trying to live a godly life. <clears throat> always acknowledging him or looking for his coming. This is interesting. He says, but those people that are pure, that are looking for the coming, they believe the literal scriptures, they will be called psychotic because of me who saved them. Because of me who saved them, because of the Messiah, Jesus, because we believe in it literally, and he's literally coming back, and we're literally going to have eternal life. And we literally need to try to be pure and merciful and quiet and kind. And, you know, that were real questions. We don't just say, oh, it's symbolic or something else. Um, if you believe the Bible and want to live your life by it, you're a psychotic maniac. Isn't that interesting? So it gets like that. Christians are weird. We need them out of society. So that's what it gets like. Maybe, hopefully not over here, but anyway. Now, look at this, though. So these are people that are looking for his coming. And because they're actually looking for and believing in a real rapture, pre-trib rapture, they're called crazy um, because of Jesus. It shall come to pass also in those days. So in the days when it gets really bad and we're being persecuted and we're trying to remain holy and they're calling us nuts because we believe in a rapture, all of a sudden it will come to pass in those days that my father shall gather together out of that generation the pure ones. Even the pure and faithful souls, those to whom I will appear and with whom I will make my habitation. Jesus says, I'll come back and receive you to myself, that there I am, you may be also in my father's house or many mansions. If it were not to were not so, I would have told you. <clears throat> so not the angels, but this is, I thought that was interesting because the angels gather the elect at the second coming after the destruction. So there's a couple prophecies about that. This doesn't say the father sends angels and gathers people. This says when everybody's trying to persecute us and we're called crazy, my father himself, the power of God will gather together out of that generation all the pure ones. And that will happen when he appears to us. You know, it talks about when his appearing occurs, then we'll be raptured. Um, and to whom I will make my habitation. So that's really interesting. It goes on and talks about a whole bunch of other things that happens. Um, uh, persecution, um, all sorts of other stuff, the you know, the birth pangs and things like that. So this is here. And I want to get down here. Um, let's see here. 
Um, they are the ones, okay, talking about evil people will control the gold and the silver. The children of this world will maintain their wealth by controlling, buying and selling. It's kind of like a mark or something, you know. They will afflict many because many of them will call on God for deliverance. So the people in the tribulation period will call on God for deliverance. That's what the tribulation period's for. Uh, blessed are they who are not alive at that time. Blessed are they who live and endure to the end. For when these things come to pass, soon she that travails is near to bring forth, and the time is fulfilled. But I want to draw your attention to this then. Then, really cool word, then, after that happens, then, shall the son of perdition, that adversary, who boasts and exalts himself above all that's called God, works many signs and miracles that he may deceive the whole earth and overcome the innocent. That's when he comes. Blessed are those who endure to the, in those days, but woe to those who are deceived. So it's interesting to me. Now, if, if you believe in a pre, not a pre, a mid-trib rapture, you might say the, when the, the coming of the son of perdition, when the Antichrist is revealed, it's when he sets in the temple of God in the middle of the tribulation saying, I'm Christ. Okay. And, you know, you could look at it that way. But the problem with that is if that's the case, then the Christians haven't been raptured yet, which means we're still here. You can go online right now and look at people. Anytime there's a 10 nation or a 10 group of anything, is that the 10 nations? And anytime somebody does anything or tries to make a covenant or a peace deal or something like that, and it just happens to be seven years, is that the seven year tribulation? We constantly do that. And I'm not making fun of everybody. It just means we want to go home. And it, is it happening yet? Well, this is a seven. That's a 10, maybe, you know. So we look at those things. Point being, if... The Antichrist reveals himself to the world in the middle of the tribulation, and there hasn't been a pre-trib rapture. We're still here. We would know. I mean, when you when you look at it first, he signs a seven-year covenant. He's the head of ten nations. He's the head of a nation north of Israel. He just comes and attacks Egypt. The process of that, the Egyptian, the Nile River is completely destroyed. Last I checked, the Nile River is still okay. So not, not time yet. <clears throat> That's just like five things. But there's, there's a good 10 or more prophecies that if you pull them together, very specific. His name equals 666 when spelled out in Greek. Um, that one I think could be hard because the spelling would change from one language to another. You know, so anyway. But that's just one prophecy out of many. So point being, when it starts, when that seven-year period starts, Anybody that knows anything about prophecy would be able to identify the Antichrist very clearly. And there will be a lot of people that do not like him. There will be patriots that are even unsaved that don't like him. Egypt will not like him. Three of the ten nations will not like him and go to war with him. So there's going to be a lot of interesting things. So point being, I want to share this with you. So let's back up with this. He starts talking about inside the church, we get corrupted. And then because of our own stupidity and not standing up for the gospel, people get more corrupted and they don't like the pure ones that, that try to stand up for the Lord. They say that we're the weird ones, the crazy ones, the insane ones. So when it gets bad at that point, those that look for the Lord, it comes to pass that the father gathers us out of that generation of pure ones. And Jesus appears to us and takes us to his habitation. That's a rapture. Then, after the rapture, then the son of perdition is revealed. So if you take this and pull it back into 2 Thessalonians, it kind of creates a pretty cool picture. Now, this is not authoritative. But what I'm saying here is, it's an interesting trip that I did. So here's Eusebius talking about Papias is the greatest researcher ever. He's got all these direct quotes and stories from eyewitnesses about people that knew the apostles. 
great guy, except he was dense enough to believe in a pre-trib or a pre-millennial reign and probably pre-trib. Uh, and that's where Irenaeus got his weird ideas. Irenaeus is very clearly pre-millennial and pre-trib. So supposedly he gets it from specific unwritten parables. Now, all of a sudden, and of course we see the Irenaeus's idea on premillennialism and pre-trib. Then we find a few documents that report to be those unwritten parables. And sure enough, I would, you know, I'm reading this. I'm like, okay, if you believed this, I would say pre-trib and premillennial. And Eusebius would say, Ken, you're not that bright, are you? You ought to know it's symbolic. And this is just, he got confused. Don't let him confuse you. So pretty interesting. But I wanted to share this to you. So this is a, another one of those, <clears throat> not first, but second or third century documents. There's quite a few of those. Church fathers, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, uh, Ephraim, the Syrian. Uh, you've got um, Cyprian. You've got uh, the, uh, there's, there's a handful of others. Anyway, it's just interesting. So this is new to me, and it's an interesting kind of rabbit trail I got on and kind of a happy thing that I noticed. So I just wanted to share that to you. So there are other documents, okay, that talk about these things. But again, the church fathers are not authoritative. They're not in the canon. Uh, if they actually saw the apostles, and if they wrote everything down honestly and correctly, and if they haven't been deliberately tampered with through the 2,000 years of, you know, weird stuff that happens, and if we're interpreting it correctly, then that's pretty cool. And that's what I've always done in my life. I went to the early church fathers and said, well, what did they, did they talk about eternal security or can you lose your salvation? Do the gifts ever stop? Um, how do you get saved? Um, what about the Antichrist and the second coming? What about this? What about that? Things that I'd always wondered about. Your denomination might teach something different on a certain subject than my denomination. So my question is, who's right? Well, let's go back and see what the disciples of the apostles taught. So you go back and look at them, and sure enough, they're all consistent up to the first 200 years. They all taught the same thing, and then we start getting different ideas. So if you take that as it must be pure, then find a denomination that agrees with that. So, and that's how I became a Calvary Chapel guy. I wasn't originally raised a Calvary Chapel. Now, recently I've been studying the Dead Sea Scrolls. And some of that stuff is pretty amazing too. They believe in the Messiah, the Holy Spirit, and the Father, Hashem, being three, and yet somehow are God. They believe that the Messiah incarnates and he dies for our sins to reconcile us to God. The event happens in 32 AD, starting the age of grace. There's a whole bunch of stuff in 11Q13 and several other scrolls. So to me, what's interesting is it's not Judaism versus Christianity, which is what the Pharisees would have us believe. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Zadok priest said, this is Judaism. It's exactly the same as New Testament Christianity. And then when you go to the early church fathers, they teach the same thing too. So you've got before, during, and after the exact same teachings, you know, except there's an apostasy in the middle of it with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. There's an apostasy in the first century church with Gnostic cults. Um, and, but, you know, they either mesh together with the New Testament or they don't. So very, very interesting studies. So we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. And we'll come back next week, continue to study the prophecy, the scrolls, um, the Nephilim and things like that. So let me go to the chat room and we'll just see if we have any questions. It looks like we have a few. <coughs> Excuse me. Can we get this unpublished book? Um, yeah, that, that one copy of it anyway. Um, it's... Um, that translation, I'm I'm going to redo it and make it a little more modern. But that particular translation is um, was translated by a guy or a team of guys back in 1902. So it's public domain now. And so 
confused me a little bit because I have the Antonacine Fathers, and that's a 10-volume set. Supposedly, this thing says it is um, a set produced in the 1902. Antonacine Fathers should be the same stuff, but it is a 25-volume set. And I'm thinking, like, maybe they just did it differently, but I don't have that one. That's not in my... You know, when you go to um, uh, eSword, I always use eSword, and you guys know that. But when we go to eSword, you go to here, and you can have all these extra books you can download. They're not the Bible. So you've got Nicene, post-Nicene, and I'll do that a lot. Here's the Antonicene Fathers. Volume 10 actually is an index, so it's actually nine, nine books. But this is all the stuff that I have, and I tried to go through that really well. And this is not in here anywhere. So that's pretty interesting, but done back in 1902. So we're going to try to continue to publish those kind of things. We've got on our network, we have Polycarp translated. We're working on some of the epistles of Ignatius just to kind of see how things work. Eusebius we're working on. Just really interesting to see those. Eventually, they'll all be books and you can buy them on Amazon too. Uh, but it just takes time to go through. We want to make sure we're doing it right and understanding it right, translating it as well as we can. Um, did you ever get Dr. Doug Hamp's book on post-trib? Um, I don't think I did. No, I know Doug Hamp, but I haven't read that. He gave me a book not too long ago. I think it was Corrupting the Image, Volume 2 in which he has uh, an idea for a different trans slightly different translation of it was a nephilim artifact but anyway so kind of an interesting deal you said that he handed you a book at the conference oh yeah that was the yeah corrupting the image volume two i think it was anyway but yeah it wasn't about the pre-trib rapture or post-trib rapture or anything it was something else so no i didn't get that um listening to michael heiser on youtube he references other books that the scholars use in their research. The Testament of Solomon, the Apocalypse of Elijah. How can we get a hold of these books? Um, it's very difficult to do. Um, testaments would be, if they're real, are very, very valuable. Uh, Testament of Solomon, I haven't studied. I went over it really briefly in seminary, and I don't remember anything about it. Uh, Apocalypse of Elijah is... There, there are several versions, and they all seem, ones that I know about seem to be fake. But, you know, uh, Josephus mentions that Elijah wrote a book on prophecy. And so that's got to be the Apocalypse of Elijah. And so pretty interesting. There's actually an ancient commentary on the Apocalypse of Elijah in medieval times. Um, and it, there's not much to it that I can, I mean, it's obviously really garbled. Uh, but some of the interesting things in there is it talks about the calendar, the idea, and then putting the calendar systems together. And this is how you figure prophecy on the calendars and not a whole lot of detail, but just ideas like that that kind of come out. <clears throat> so those are something, yeah, if we can ever get them. And, uh, well, it's like we produce the Book of Jasher, but there's like two other books called the Book of Jasher from at least the Middle Ages or maybe even further back that are obviously fake. And it's like in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have the Testament of Abraham, which is probably actually written by Abraham. Uh, we also have the Book of Abraham uh, that the Mormons produced, which is obviously fake. So, I mean, just because it's got the name in it, you you got to be careful of that. Um, the Maturionian canon fragment actually says that there is a real epistle that Paul wrote to Laodicea. Of course, we know that from Colossians. You know, make the Laodiceans read Colossians and you read the epistle I sent them. So there is a real one, but there's also a fake one written specifically in, in Paul's name to counter the Marcion heresy. And so... Which one do we have? We do have a copy of one of them. So, you know, so it's one of those things you just got to take real careful with. We will continue working on that, though. If we can figure out for sure what's what, we'll, we'll definitely produce them, reproduce them. So any reference to the tribulation 
that can't be broken into tribulation as in the first three and a half years and the great tribulation and last three. It refers to all of the seven year tribulation. Uh, some people do. Some some church fathers will talk about the tribulation and that is the seven year period. And then sometimes I'll talk about the great tribulation, which is that last half, which is the worst part of the worst. And so you'll see that in the literature. But many times they'll also come up and talk about the tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's associated with Daniel chapter nine. And it's the last week. So it's a seven year period. And so they, they make that very, very clear in all of the writings. So there is a seven year tribulation. There is a the last three and a half years of that are the great tribulation. <clears throat> but then some people will talk about how great that tribulation is going to be. And so sometimes it'll be translated that way and they'll still be referring to the seven. But basically, there's a seven year period divided into two, three and a half year periods. It's confusing, but that's why you can't just take one quote. Um, like um, one of the church fathers, somebody quoted one to me one time. He's trying to prove post-trib rapture, post or mid or something. Anyway, he's quoting um, Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr says that the uh, Antichrist will make war against us, the Christians. And so, well, the only way he can do that is if we're still here. So he must be a post-trib guy, right? But then he turns around and he's pre-trib. So how could he be pre-trib and make a comment like that? Well, Christian means believer. And in their mind, if you were a believer in the Messiah, coming Messiah, way back when, or one now, a believer is a believer. A follower, a believer is a believer of the Messiah. Somebody that believes in the Messiah is a mess messianic or a Christian. So they're just using it in that way. So if he says the Antichrist persecutes the church, all believers, uh, you'd have to also look and see if they said something about a pre-trib rapture. So you have to pull it all together. Um, did I? Okay. Okay, must have clicked on it. <clears throat> what is the title of this book and where can I find it? Oh, the, um, okay, Eusebius is called Eusebius, the father of church history. Uh, you can find them online quite a bit, a lot of different places. This is a book that we did. It's called The End Times by the Church Fathers. And that's just pulling together um, the, the prophecy things about uh, from Irenaeus and these things. So they talk about the Roman Empire, for instance, the Ten Nations, the Abomination of Desolation, Christ being from the tribe of Dan, uh, the number 666, uh, pre-trib rapture, premillennialism. And then we got the same thing from Ephraim. He talks a lot about that stuff, the origin of the Antichrist, the first three and a half years. Oh, you can't see that here. You turn that off real quick. Okay, there we go. Um things like that, Enoch and Elijah, that's Ephraim. And then Hippolytus has got two books in here, but about there's a lot of stuff in here about Daniel's beasts and the ten toes and what they believe they mean. So that's so it's just prophecy from the early church fathers. And then this one that we're looking at, the new thing to me, it's actually called The Testament of Our Lord Jesus Christ, supposedly written by Clement. And Obviously, the there's a it's a really big manuscript, but the last 80% of it is stuff we wouldn't care about. But you can just query this, the testament of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you should be able to find it. It's uh, put out by a group of people from, I want to say Cornell University. Anyway, back in 1902. So that'll be the one to look for. Um, let's see here. Why does it seem like there is no reference for God, reverence, I'm sorry, for God in the churches anymore? This isn't a denominational thing. It's an American thing. Is orthodoxy gone? Am I the only one concerned? Uh, I am too. Um, it's, we, we have this attitude, I think, in most of the churches that uh, we want to get people saved. And so if something weird goes on, that's not dangerous, like somebody talking too much, the kids running or playing or, or whatever, you know, we, you know, or someone shows up and 
they start coming to church and they're not married. Well, just let, I've, I've even been told that in churches. It's like, yeah, those two aren't married. We need to talk to them about it. Uh, no, 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 no. They might leave the church that way. You let them stay. You let them become a member. Eventually, they'll be reading the Bible. Holy Spirit will talk to them and they'll fix that. And it's like, that's not the way we're supposed to do it. So, I mean, if someone shows up at the church and wants to work in the children's ministry, you need to double check that they're not a pedophile. If someone shows up and wants to be with the, you know, in the ushers and count the tithe money, do they have a criminal record for theft? I mean, at least check those things out, you know. Uh, but I think it's just because we're so focused on, um, you know, bringing people to church, getting them saved uh, and that kind of stuff. And we should have a little more focus on the church is where believers get together to worship the Lord and study. So, you know, you talk to your friend, you lead him to the Lord, you can bring him to church. I mean, but I mean, basically bring Christian brothers to the Lord and then we study. And of course, part of studying is you can't show up drunk and you can't be doing drugs. You know, you have to stop. You might be a believer, but this is what we have to do. And that's just the way it is. But and you'll still see that in some of the Catholic churches. I mean, they'll be very strict which I think is interesting, but yeah, it's this idea that they'll get mad and they'll go away and some of them will, but they probably would anyway in time. And in the meantime, you don't want to corrupt the people you have. When you say something like you, you shouldn't do drugs to your kids and then someone comes to church that's obviously on drugs and you don't kick him out of the church, the kids eventually start thinking, okay, well, I probably shouldn't but it's not that big of a deal and I can do it anyway and nobody will say anything. And that's not the kind of message we want to give people. We don't want them to hurt themselves uh, with sin. So yeah, there's, there's doesn't seem to be a reverence for God. And I see that in a lot of different ways. Um, even in the Calvary Chapel, sometimes I think they're a little lax with different things. So of course, maybe I'm too harsh, uh, but it's, it's something we definitely need to think of. There's got to be a balance because we got to be able to talk to people, to counsel to people, to get people saved. We also have to protect our family and church family is family. So very, very important. And no, you're not the only one. Which book is he reading from? Is it published? Oh, um, yeah, just in case. Eusebius is Ecclesiastical History. Um, and you can get that just about anywhere. End Times by the Church Fathers is one we put together, which is uh, just the prophecy stuff from some of the Church Fathers. And then this one is something I'm just now working on, but it was it was published back in 1902. So I don't know if you can get a hardback book on it or not, <clears throat> but it was published. Uh, it, it's a, a Syriac document that was published in 1902 from uh, some people in Cornell University. So... Um, Anyway, so, and this is not like the only one. There are multiple copies of this. And then there's the same kind of thing, almost identical in different languages. There's also supposed to be the same exact thing in the Ethiopian canon. But I don't have, as far as I know, no one has ever translated that into English. So pretty interesting. And again, this is just one more document that shows a pre-trip. And even if you think this was fake and it was made up, point being, Darby didn't invent a pre-trib rapture. Somebody all the way through, be they right or wrong, has taught a pre-trib rapture. I wouldn't be surprised if there's not somebody all the way through that taught mid-trib or post-trib. I mean, it's just, you know, somebody's, you can read it and come up with an idea and then write it down on paper. And if it doesn't, get destroyed a thousand years from now somebody would see the paper so uh, it does it's not authoritative but it's just interesting to see these things are still there are there teachings and ancient writings that explain genesis 1 3 <clears throat> god said let there be light since the sun and moon were created on the fourth day any connection to jesus the light of the world um, not that I know of. There's some Kabbalistic stuff that try to explain it in a new agey kind of way. Um, and there might be, but I don't know of any specific. 
Um, I've heard a lot of people talk about that. The fact and the Dead Sea Scrolls are very specific that the sun and the moon are created on the fourth day of the week. That's why the calendar starts on the fourth day of the week. So, and they have a 364 day calendar. So every year starts off on a Wednesday, which is nice because you can see what's going on in the New Testament. You know how close it is to a Sabbath, exactly when it happened. So it's a, it's a really nice calendar. Plus it helps you see prophecies you don't otherwise see. Uh, but I don't, yeah, I don't see anything specific like that or don't know of anything specific like that. Uh, could the mortal king be the Antichrist? Maybe, but the way that it's written, it's almost like, um, well, it says then the Antichrist is revealed. So actually it still could be. We'll have to continue looking at it and see. That's why I think it'd be kind of cool to pull all of those together. The early church fathers, which we've done, um, any of those kind of things. I'd like to get all of those collections, all of those things, just to see how different they are, if they're very different. And then try to figure out, you know, what might have been edited in the Middle Ages or whatever. So, so far in that one, it was pretty much the church becomes immoral um there's there's wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and famines and earthquakes and then there's false christ and all that stuff still in matthew and but the way it says it there is pretty interesting first corinthians 10 2 states that israel in the desert was baptized unto moses what does that mean uh baptism is a way that you enter into a covenant uh, in, in the Hebrew mindset. So in, in Christianity, we usually just think of you, you get baptized when you accept the Lord, which is the same thing. You're showing publicly you're entering a covenant with the Lord. You're going to be a Christian. Not perfect. Nobody's perfect, but you're going to try to be a Christian. You're, you accept him. You believe it. You're saved, that kind of thing. And the baptizer has talked with you enough and known you that he's actually testifying to. I know this person's a Christian. And so I'm baptizing him. And that, that's why it's important in a persecuted country to know that the pastor who's risking his life is going to risk his life for this person. He's got to be legit. So, uh, but in the, the Hebrew mindset, you do get baptized if you repent of sin or join an order or get married. And you can see the concept the lady goes from having to be obedient to her father to being obedient to her husband. So once she's married, if dad says do this, husband says do the opposite, you follow the husband. You're not in that household anymore. You're in this one. And same thing if you were to say, I think Sadducees are right. You get baptized and become a Sadducee. And then later on, you decide, wait, what was I thinking? I, I'm, I'm a Pharisee at heart. So you leave the order, you make a written document saying, I'm, I don't believe this anymore. I was, you know, and you leave the order, you go become a Pharisee and you would get rebaptized. So anytime you would get married or remarried or anytime you would join or rejoin some sort of a, a denomination, if, if you will, Pharisee, Sadducee, Essene, whatever, you would get rebaptized. So in this case, they're talking about baptized into Moses or unto Moses, they're basically saying that they entered the covenant with Moses. They were sprinkled with blood. They were circumcised if they weren't circumcised, because that's part of the law of Moses. And then they were baptized. So they were officially entering a covenant at that point. Really interesting. <clears throat> so that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the proper way of looking at it or not looking at it as far as baptism. But it's it, you need to know why the denomination, be they right or wrong, what they believe, so you can understand why they're doing that stuff. For instance, we're told to baptize and to take the, the communion. And in history, there is um, Friends or the Quaker denomination. They at one point said, we're not going to do either one. And the reason for that is because the Catholics were saying that these rituals are important to keep you saved. They actually do something kind of magical or whatever. And the Protestants were saying, no, they don't. They do something else. And so, uh, and I forget what it was. A certain Protestant group was saying they don't save you or anything, but
but they actually do something. Like when you take communion, the saints are actually there taking it with you or something like that. Um, so they considered both of those a little strange. So to prove their point of it doesn't do anything, it's a ritual, you know, like a love feast. We just eat food. It's one of those things. So to prove that, they said, we're not going to do either one of those, period. You know, and so I would disagree on that. I don't think they should have, but I can understand why they did it in that time period. So same kind of stuff happens here. Um, have you ever heard of the book of the prophet Elijah? Do you believe this is possibly authentic? Thank you for your time. Yes, uh, Josephus talks. Yeah, Josephus talks about it. <clears throat> and I have looked at three or four medieval texts that say that they are them. And it, they're nothing so far. So there's at least three or four versions that are garbage. But there had to have been one 2,000 years ago. And in my mind, if it existed 2,000 years ago, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's still around somewhere. If you find one, though, you just have to compare it to the New Testament. If it looks garbled or is weird, it's got that certain Gnostic flavor, then you know there's nothing to it. Uh, but there, okay. But there haven't been seven-year agreements in the past, have there? Uh, oh, there have been. Yeah, several things, several times. Not several, I guess, but there's at least been two or three uh, seven-year agreements. Usually they don't pan out. Most agreements don't pan out. M most of the time we're talking about um, like a covenant between Israel and uh, the Arabs or certain Arab countries or whatever, Muslim countries. Um, uh, Jimmy Carter brokered one. Um, I think Clinton brokered, I mean, several people had done that. Um, and I remember one specifically, it was going to be a five-year covenant, but it would take two years to implement. And everybody got really happy. It's like, Ooh, five plus two is seven. Maybe that's it. You know, maybe anything like that you look at, you know, maybe it is, you know, so it turned out not to be, but yeah, there have been things like that before. And so uh, along like with the 10 nations, uh, for the longest time, we thought maybe the European common market was it because it started off originally with 10 nations or it got up to 10 nations, but then it, they kept adding to it and ended up being 27. So then there was talk about, well, could the original 10 be it? You know, maybe, but then England left the order when they were running the original 10. So it's like, okay, it's probably not it. Now they're talking about there's a G5 and a G7. And if they add, like if the G7, those are just nations that make a, a covenant for like selling or gold standards or something like that, some sort of economic thing. Uh, but if they added three more, the G7 would be G10. You know, and people look at it and say, ah, that's not a country. Well, don't, don't dismiss it. There's 10 somethings. Most likely they're just countries like Syria and Egypt and, you know, but maybe not. I mean, there's 10 some, that's the one thing we know for sure. There's 10 countries that come together and they don't agree very well. Then there's an antichrist that comes from the north of Israel. And then there's a seven year covenant that's made with somebody. So it's like the seven years, the 10 nations or groups or something is what we're looking for. Now the church fathers tend to be pretty specific, but again, since they're not authoritative, I would guess that they're probably right, but maybe not. So we just want to keep our eyes open for everything. And if we can ever prove a church father or disprove a church father, that'd be fantastic. Either way, you know, just to take it a step further. So those are the kind of things we're trying to do. Where do we read these parables? I uh, don't know. This is just something that they had mentioned. It may be connected with those. Um, that didn't say anything about the parables, but it's that kind of thing. Uh, hopefully we can find those. And I just think it's interesting too. He didn't come. It would be easiest just to come against him and say, you're, you're of limited intelligence because you're a moron. You know that nothing is written outside the scriptures. That's true. That's fake stuff. It's Gnostic stuff. That would have been the easiest thing to say, but he didn't say that. He said that he recorded this stuff there from eyewitness accounts. They're legitimate. 
He just misunderstands them because he takes them too literally. So to say that you're actually endorsing the parables, you're just saying his interpretation is wrong. And so it's like, well, let's look at the parables and see. So anyway, we'll, we'll see. Eventually those things, I think a lot of this stuff is going to come out in the next few years. Did they translate the Dead Sea Scrolls Testament of Abraham? Yes, they did. Um, and the, let's see here. Let me go to... Um, I can spell my own thing. Okay, here's our website here. And if you go to the bookstore, we have Testaments of the Patriarchs. And this is our English version of all of those. Except there's an error and we need to do it again. Okay, well, okay, let's just try to do it again just to see. Okay, that's better. Um, and if we can read a sample here. Okay, anyway. This has got um, several different things in it. It's got the 12, but it's got, um, let's see here. Um, we don't have Adam's or uh, Canaan's or the other guy, Seth's. But we're told by Josephus and other people that they did exist. Josephus actually records a prophecy out of Adam's testament. But we do have Adam's son, Enos. We have a piece of his testament. And then uh, uh, Enoch, of course, is a book of Enoch. Uh, you've got Noah, Abraham, Jacob, and his 12 sons. And then Levi, Amram, uh, Kohath, Amram, and then Aaron. We don't have a testament of Moses in here. But the idea, what they teach is from Adam to Aaron, they all wrote a last will and testament. And it's pretty interesting because it's all straightforward Christian theology. So, and it, the, the story behind it is interesting because in the mid Middle Ages, somebody found, supposedly found the testaments of the 12 patriarchs. So that's the sons of Jacob. And they presented it to, I think, the Syriac and Armenian churches, two of them anyway, two, two of the Eastern Orthodox churches. And they accepted it as being canon. They translated it into Greek, put it in their Bible. That's how we got it. That's the story. But the Hebrew versions don't exist. Nobody knows anything about where they came from, just supposedly from the Judean hills somewhere. Um, and so, and they're way, way too Christian. So it just sounds like fiction, you know? And so that's where it was left. And then 1948, we get the Dead Sea Scrolls. We get at least four of those. Now, they're fragmented, but fairly large pieces. And the pieces we have are identical with what we have. So the story of them finding it in the Judean hills is probably true because we found other copies of them in the Judean hills in 1948. But not just the 12, though. We have all these pieces of, of these others. Fascinating reads. So anyway, so yes, Testament of Abraham has been translated. Testament of Noah is probably my favorite because of the prophecies that it has. So they're all, they're all in there actually too. And if you want to double check it, you can always go to the Dead Sea Scroll Library uh, in Israel. They, they have it online and you can actually, you know, blow them up. High res photos, you can actually blow them up. And decide if that's the letter, you know, Aleph, or if it's a smudge on a Ain or something like that. Uh, so you can read it and decide for yourself. So that's what's really nice about it. Did they talk about eternal security? <clears throat> oh, the church fathers. Um, um, not exactly. So not, not enough as far as being able to say that they believed in eternal security or that they did not. They talked about sinless perfectionism. They talked about the gifts of the spirit. They talked about prophecy. They talked about some new age stuff. Um, but they also didn't seem to be worried about it. The interesting thing I think about it is if they believed you could lose your salvation and you could do that fairly easily, I think there would have been a ton of, of um, um, sermons about be careful, don't, you know, because it would have been mentioned. And, but maybe not, that's just my opinion. So yeah, that's one thing they didn't, they weren't really specific on. Another book that we did, 
is um, we have a lot of them in here. There's our Dead Sea Scroll collection. But this one here, the Ancient Church Fathers, that's the one that um, we went through and did all that. So there are quotes for uh, what they would teach about Roman Catholicism, Calvinism, um, gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, uh, stuff like that, in just kind of in a blanket thing. And then we went back and did an in-depth one on just the prophecies, which is in here somewhere. Hold on a second. Messianic. Oh, end times by the church fathers. This one right here. So we've been we've been putting together lots of books for quite a while. Um, let's see here. Why isn't there more real fellowship at churches? which is to me an important is as important as reverence that I, I totally agree. That's one thing I really like about our church. Uh, we get together, we have the children's church upstairs, we have the adult service. And then afterwards we have a fellowship dinner. It's basically a potluck. And I guess not too many people do this, but we do it every week unless something comes up that happens to be Christmas or mother's day or whatever. Usually it's like you go spend it with your family. But 90% of the time, uh, if you come to church, you will be invited to stay for dinner. And then over dinner, we get to know you, start talking about stuff. And, you know, do, do we have a, a young marrieds group, a singles group, uh, a Bible study group? Do we have home groups? You know, stuff like that. And a lot of people have come and said, now this, this is a church. I, I can't tell you how many people coming sometimes the first time first or second time it's just like we you do this every week you just hang out and have fun and be a family and yeah that's it's pretty cool yeah we we uh we're growing quite a bit with that of course again we also have to be careful because we've had a few strange people come in that have to be watched and possibly escorted out uh we don't want any problems we love our people and we want to protect them so yeah i totally agree there should be more fellowship we're small. We're actually growing pretty good, but we're still small enough. We have one Tuesday night Bible study, which is just a home fellowship. That's the one in my church, my home on Tuesday nights. That's the only actual fellow uh, home group, so to speak. But we do have one for the guys, one for the uh, just the men, and one for the women. And we have uh, children's ministries, and we just started a couples group that goes out you know to restaurants and fellowships unfortunately they do it on monday nights so monday nights i'm here doing this with you guys so my wife and i don't go to that one but i mean there's a lot more ministries starting up when we get more people it'll be pretty interesting but yeah i wish more of them would do that it's it's important to be protected it's important to fellowship and we're going to eat lunch anyway we can you know do a potluck it doesn't really cost anything more than anything else and we get together and it's pretty neat just to talk about things <clears throat> most of us are all prophecy minded from my understanding the hebrew water is not a creation what is your understanding from my, from my understanding of hebrew the hebrew language okay water is not a creation I guess I I guess I see where you're getting it from in the the on the first day the Holy Spirit covered the waters. Um, well, God created everything physical, so it had to be created somewhere, unless it has a, a metaphys metaphysical type meaning or something. So yeah, I'd never really thought of that before. I see where you're getting it, but I don't know that anybody ever said anything about it. Are you talking about a mikvah when you're talking about getting baptized into a sect? Yes. Uh, mikvah is just their word, for, a Hebrew word for a baptism, a baptismal, you know, and you, you do that right. You actually go and you you, you get into a, a, a mikvah and you kind of baptize yourself and somebody's there watching you, making sure you go all the way under, all the way up, and then you get a written piece of paper showing that it was an effectual baptism. Uh, so it's pretty interesting that way. And that's why they talked about, you know, John the Baptist. He was baptizing in the Jordan. Why? Is he starting a new sect that's going to, you know, try to rival us? No, he's baptizing under repentance. Oh, okay. Just making people get, okay. 
So he baptizes you. You're still a Pharisee, Sadducee, whatever. You're still married. You know, not not one of those. So it's really interesting to see. Uh, Ezekiel 29, 10 and 36 both refer to the Tower of, okay, do you think, oh, what do you think that is? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I would have to look that up. Um, I remember a controversy about it, about where it might be. So I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up and see. Um, Dr. Heiser says Adam's Testament is with the scholars. Oh, okay. Wish they would publish it for the rest of us. Yeah, like I was saying, now, if that's true, we should be able to find it. If I can get my hands on it, 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 it will be published. So, but anyway, point being is when we look at Josephus, most of you know about Josephus. Josephus says Adam made a prophecy about the flood and the fire judgments, basically saying he knew the world would be destroyed two times and how it would come back. He didn't know, but there was two judgments and he didn't know which one was first. But then it gave it gave a quote, actually, of that prophecy. So you can't quote it unless you're quoting from something. And so with the kind of a concept, so you've got Adam's Testament uh, quoted. You, and then Seth is, they mentioned that Seth wrote a testament and then the pillars, the calculations of the calendar and stuff. And then there was Canaan. Uh, yeah. Who wrote something. Oh, yeah. He, he mentions that he wrote, he figured out or knew somehow that the flood would come first. And he wrote a few other things and put it with his treasures, it says. And then uh, Enos, we have that. So the first four, we actually have either a copy of it, a quote of it, or a reference from somebody telling us that it existed. And what I've always told people is like, if my grandfather was a prophet, there's no way I'm letting that disappear. I'm going to scan it, replicate it, print it, publish it, put it in multiple places all around. Now, of course, I can do that through the internet, but point being, I'm going to make sure there's copy after copy. I'm not going to risk losing anything. Um, and so if these things are real, somebody would have kept them. You know, and I don't think that the Essenes basically just went ah and ran out and left all of their stuff. I think they buried some of the stuff and took most of the library with them. I think they knew later on that it would probably be a fulfillment of, since they were accurate prophets, I think they understood that it would be a fulfillment of, of uh, Isaiah 29. That's just my opinion. But yeah, uh, that's interesting. So Heiser says it exists somewhere. I'll have, to, I'll have to look into that. I would imagine. I just, I can't imagine those things not existing anymore. But as I understand, a mikvah makes one pure before making a covenant. And a baptism is evidence of a covenant that has been made already. Okay. It could just be the way they did something like that. But yeah, in, in Christian theology, a baptism is you making a public confession that you have become a Christian. So that's absolutely true. Um, so yeah, maybe they looked at it differently. Most Christians would go crazy if you're if you're saying like, I need to be rebaptized. Why? I'm getting married or I'm leaving this church and becoming, you know, most Christian denominations would be like, that doesn't make any sense. There's a few denominations that would say if you if you leave there and come and join us, you have to be rebaptized. There's a handful of those, but it is interesting to see. So, okay, well, we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. Good study, hour and a half like normal. Um, so we will continue um, looking at these things, and I, I hope you guys enjoy this kind of stuff. We're going to continue to study these manuscripts, and this is what I want to do because a lot of times people will speculate about the nephilim or the demonic world or they will speculate about prophecy and when you don't have any more information you have to speculate but my whole attitude is like before i speculate let's see if there's any text anywhere that says anything not modern scholarship but um 
our mean modern commentary written by a really smart guy. That's that's good too. But we want to get any old manuscript that's there. And then that's probably trash. Most of the old manuscripts are garbage. I, I totally agree. A lot of cults all the way through the centuries, but some of them are not. And I think we we miss the boat by either being like in an orthodox place where everything is tradition and everything's, you know, and there's a thousand extra books in a canon. Or from a Protestant mindset where it's like there's 66 books and I don't want to read anything else, period. I think both of those are really an error. And we need to take all that stuff um, and, and see where it, it, it uh, takes us. So we'll go ahead and um, uh, one more question popped up. Uh, are there true prophets today? The Bible talks about false ones, so I'm not sure. Um, <coughs> the um, minor prophets talk about in the end times that there are prophets. So there either has been all the way through, or maybe there hasn't been, but the Lord, you know, it's, it's up to the Lord to make you a prophet, a healer, a whatever, a pastor. Um, the church fathers talk about all of the gifts continuing to function until the rapture or second coming, that, that thing. Um, so if you follow that and the whole, there's, there's things in the Dead Sea Scrolls that talk about basically a guardian, which is a prophet slash speaker in tongues, which allows them to, you know, it's an interesting combination. So if you put that together, the church fathers, the Bible seems to indicate that it's continuing. The church fathers said it will. The Dead Sea Scrolls said it either continues or they come back, one of the two. And I believe we're living in the end times. So I absolutely believe that there would be true prophets today. Um, I have never met one. I have met a lot of people that say they're prophets. And after talking with them for five minutes, I'm getting ready to throw them out the door because they're just liars. Uh, so I've met a lot of liars in my time. Never met a single real prophet. But I believe the church fathers and the scrolls, which means they're here somewhere. And with that in mind, I think there's a school of prophets somewhere that probably has all of these extra books, the real ones, you know. So pretty interesting. Uh, we'll see. And I think more things will come out as we go. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and say good night. Uh, God bless you guys, and we will see you next week.